In this WellSeeker Pro training video, we'll be working through an example where we populate the database tree with everything from operator level down to well level. We'll then create four different well plans which all hit the same target. This will introduce some of the different planning tools available within the program, and during the course of the video, we'll also look at some of the chart and reporting outputs. For this example, all the data I'll be using to populate the database is located in an Excel spreadsheet which will be made available to anyone watching this training video. Please note that the example provided may differ from the one that I'll be working through, but while the data may be different, the method of data entry will be the same. So by following these steps, regardless of the example, you'll end up with the same desired outcome. So this is the Excel document that we're going to be looking at and uh, using to populate the database. It's got all the information that we need and we'll work through this as we start to, uh, to enter the data. So we're going to start by creating a new blank database. To do that, we go File, Create New Database. In this example, we're going to, I'm going to save it to my desktop. I'm going to call it Example Database. Um, I'm saving it to my desktop for ease, but it's recommended that you don't save your databases to your desktops because they're very easy to delete or move by accident. So the best place is to put them in a folder somewhere else on your computer. Database successfully created. I now need to select my database, my file, select database. And we can see We've now selected a new database. You can see that with the, um, with the file path along the bottom. And we can also see that it's a completely blank database. So now that I've got my new database, we're going to start populating it with some data. Before we start entering any data in the database tree, the first thing I'm going to take a look at is the units and make sure that we have the correct units selected. So for our example, we're going to be in US feet. So if we go to tools, unit sets, select the appropriate unit set from the drop down menu, in this case US feet, which is the default uh, as standard with the software, but it's always good just to come in here and double check. So we just hit apply, hit OK. Uh, an additional check at the bottom of the screen, again, we can see um, the unit sets that selected here. So now that we've selected our units, we're just going to go ahead and start entering data here. So if I right click on um, WellSeeker database, select insert operator, it's now going to open up my operator dialog. So the first thing we'll do is we'll select the primary logo. The reason you'd want to put a logo in here is that these logos will appear on any of your reports or um, if you are in the Wallplot Composer, you'll be able to take this logo and use it. So it's always worth, if you have a logo, putting it in here. And looking at the data sheet, the operator is in Over Natural Resources. Um, <clears throat> WellSeeker is um, a very copy and paste friendly software. Um, so if you have the data in a format which is editable like this, then you can just highlight it, Control C, Control V, or you can right click copy and right click paste and we'll paste the data in no problem. So here we've entered our name. We're not going to enter contact or address details. Uh, we don't have them in here and these also don't appear on anything. So these are just really for the user. They don't appear on any reports or anything. Really one of the most important things that you're going to enter at the operator properties um, is going to be your anti-collision settings. So if we take a look at that now, we've got a section in here that details this. So we're 3D closest approach, which we have already selected. Options are available from the drop down menu, but in this case we don't need to make any changes. We've got the pedal curve for the error services. We have error ratio for warning type. Sigma level is two, so this just manually type depending on what you want. Two is going to be the standard, um, but it can be adjusted. Do we want to include casings? No. So here, we're going to change this from the drop-down menu 
And this is all that we need to do here. We just hit apply. These warning levels, um, you can set these whatever way you wish. Uh, 1, 1 1.5 and 2 is what they would be as standard within the software. And these are the values that will flag up in the separation factor plot and also in the reports um, when you run the, uh, the anti-collision scans. Now if I right click at operator level, I can now insert my new field. So the information for our field location is down here and we'll copy our field name and we now need to select our mapping grid. So the mapping grid for this example is North American datum 1983 and Texas South Central. So there are a couple of ways that you can do this. You can select it from this part of the field properties dialog and you can just type N and it'll take you to NAD and we can scroll through and find it. The alternative is to select the mapping grid which opens up the mapping grid dialog. You can search or you can do exactly the same. The only difference is here we have all the rest of the CRS data that, um, that goes into making up the, the selected coordinate reference system. There are a lot of coordinate reference systems available within the software, um, but it's not an exhaustive list. And if you come across a coordinate reference system that we don't have within the software, you can add this by selecting Add CRS. You can then enter all the relevant data. Some of it's from drop down menu, some of it you just manually enter. Um, hit Save CRS. This will then become available for you to, to select from the drop down menu. We're not going to go in, I'm not going to go into details in this training session regarding that, but there is a document available within the help um, folder that goes into much more detail about this. So if we just go in, and for the purposes of this, we'll scroll through this, and we'll go NAD 83, and we're looking for Texas South Central US speed. We can see that there are a lot of Texas options here and they vary Texas South Central, Texas South Central US feet, Texas Central. So be very careful when you select your coordinate reference system here uh, because there can be lots of options that are very similar. So if we select this one, Texas South Central, feet US, Hit OK, and then we'll start to fill the rest of this in. As we go down to the field reference point and we start entering data in here, this will also be a good check to make sure that we have correctly selected the well, we've selected the correct mapping grid. Because when you enter an easting and a northing, it will automatically generate the lat or the long, or vice versa, based on the selected mapping grid. If the values here don't tie in with what are expected then we've either made a mistake entering the data or we've selected the wrong mapping grid. So this will be an additional check for us. The first thing we're going to do is select our azimuth north reference. And in this case, we are going to be using uh, grid north, which is in here, north reference grid. And the local coordinate system that we're going to select is well centered. And all that this means is that uh, at in our well plans at surface, um, our local coordinates will always be zero zero, regardless of um, regardless of whether we're offset um, between the well and the facility. So we don't need to make any changes here. Now we're going to enter in our field reference point. It's better to enter this in as an easting and a northing because um, these coordinates are more sensitive to decimal places than the latitude and the longitude. So if you've got the ability to enter either one, um, it's usually better to enter them either as a grid easting and a northing opposed to the lat longs. Um, but either will work. So if we select our east, just paste this in, select our north, Paste that in as well, 
and we'll just double check that these numbers tie in. So I'm happy with my latitude, 97.53, west, perfect. So this is good, I'm happy with this. The, the last thing that we need to select here is the system vertical datum. Now, this is where you, people can easily make mistakes. Um, the option that you select here is what your measure depth in TVD will be referenced to um, throughout um, the software. So it will be measure depth above mean sea level, TVD above mean sea level. Um, in almost all cases, you will not want to change this for mean sea level. Um, so be very careful here. Most of the time, you won't make any adjustments here. When you enter your rotary table elevation and your ground level elevation, this will be done at a different level in the database tree. But for the purposes of what we're looking for, if we look at our um, depth references, we're referencing mean sea level. So we hit apply, hit close, right click on our field level and we have the new option now to insert facility, which we'll select. So the facility pad location information is available here and we'll just paste in the facility name. This information here which is all greyed out is data that's been entered in the um, field level and this is just for reference so if we needed to make any changes here we would have to go back to the higher level in the database tree to do that. So we don't worry about any of this. Um, I'm not going to put a template in because uh, this is just one well, so there's no requirement to do that. So now, um, also, um, when you enter um, a coordinate or reference um, at field level, when you create your new facility, it will automatically use the same coordinates that you have entered at the, uh, at the field level. And in many cases, that will be no requirement to change them. But if you wish at this point, then you can make an adjustment. In this example, we have got the same location for our field and our facility. So all that I'm going to do here is just quickly check to make sure that these numbers tie in. And I won't actually have to re retype these at all. So that all looks good as expected. And all that I can do now is hit apply. At this point as well, you can look at the map. So if we select show map, as long as you have internet connection, you will connect to Google Maps, hold down control and scroll in with the mouse wheel. And you can look at your surface location on the map. Uh, in this particular example, we are sitting directly on the wellhead, but don't be concerned if your surface location is not sitting exactly where you want it to be. Um, Google Maps uses uh, WGS84 for, um, you know, for plotting um, surface locations. If the mapping grid that you have selected does not use WGS84, um, then the point that is plotted on this map will be slightly off. Um, so the main thing that you're looking for here is that you're in the, the area that you're expecting to be. Am I in the right state? Am I in the right area? If, if it's a little bit off the exact wellhead, that's not um, too concerning. So I'm happy with where I am. Turn off the map and close. I can now right click and select insert new well. I'll now open my well properties dialog and here is my well properties information so again we're just going to copy paste our well name we now have a couple of additional options for the wellhead location so in addition to our mapping coordinates and our geographic latitude and longitude we also have local coordinates so this would be our offset from our um, Offset from our facility. 
And if we had put in a slot template, any of those slots would be available to select from this drop down menu. So we're now going to enter our data. And in this case, again, I'm going to use my Eastern and Northern values. So we'll just copy this East, check the map option, paste in my Eastern. and paste in my northern. And I now just want to double check that the locals, they tie in, and again, my latitude and my longitude tie in as well. So these tie in. So I'm happy with all my surface locations that I have so far. The next thing that we want to look at is our depth reference. So Here's our depth reference data here. So we're going to be referencing rotary table elevation. So we click on line two, RTE, and we are choosing our elevation above system. So the system that we had um, selected that we discussed um, at field level was mean sea level. So we now need to put in here um, so vertical reference above mean sea level, 333.02, 333.02. And as I enter this information, it has also starting to populate across this side. Um, something I should have mentioned was, depending on whether you're on or offshore, you will check this option here. Um, if you're offshore, you will have the ability to enter a water depth, and you'll clearly see that this is an offshore rig. It's onshore, as is the case with our example. Um, uncheck this, and we have a ground level elevation, and we have a land rig. So our ground level elevation is going to be 310.02. 310.02. The main thing that you want to check at this point is: Does my numbers do my numbers make sense? Um, based on the elevation above the system and the ground level level elevation, Wellseeker will calculate the air gap. In this case, it's calculated it at 23 feet, which is exactly what we have here. So I'm happy that I've not made a mistake here. If you put mistype a number here or here, a good visual check to make sure you haven't made a mistake is to just check, do these numbers here make sense? And if they make sense, then you are good to go. We also want to make sure that this is our default. Um, default just means that when we create any well plans or surveys below our well, they will, by default, reference this depth reference because we can have several different depth references here. Um, so you want to select the one that, you, that you're going to be primarily using as, um, as the default. You can change it at well level and at survey level. Um, without any issues, but this just means that you won't have to. And we'll enter our rig, which is going to be Patterson 142. We hit apply. Again, if you want to view, you can view this particular location on a map. Um, I'm happy with where we are, so I'm not going to worry about doing that. We hit apply and we hit close. If we now right click at our well level, instead of having one option, which we've had up to now, oops, just delete that. Because if you notice, the second option is always greyed out. If you right click, we now have two options here. So we have a, a new insert actual well and an insert planned well. So an actual well is going to be a survey. Planned well is, of course, going to be a planned well. So for our example, we're going to be doing four planned wells. So this will be the first one. So plan properties. And we can now start entering um, the data for our first plan. So if we come along to our plan tab, we have got the name of our plan. So this is going to be design one. 
We're not going to set this plan as principal. We're going to have four well plans. Um, it's always a good idea as you're doing this, um, if you have a principal plan, to ensure that it's selected. In our case, I'm not going to pick any one of these wells over another one, so we're just going to leave this unchecked at the moment. If you look at the bottom of our data sheet, it tells us that the vertical section is the bottom hole location with the origin being the well. And this is going to be the case for all of the wells, uh, all of the plans that we create here. So um, we leave this check, this use bottom hole location, um, and we leave the origin as the well. If you uncheck this, you'll then be able to, to manually edit and put whatever value you want. But for us, we will allow the software to choose the bottom hole location. Um, automatically. Depth reference um, over here, um, because we selected the RTE as the default, we can now see that um, this is correctly selected. This is the depth reference that we um, want to use. Um, if, however, we've made a mistake here, um, you can choose from this drop down menu and you can select um, a different depth reference. So if I was to say, well, OK, I actually want to use my default, I check default, it's now going to give me a warning. So a datum currently in use by one or more actual wells has changed. Do you wish to change the TVDs to reflect this or preserve the original TVDs? This action can seriously corrupt your design. In this situation, if you want to preserve the TVDs, it means that you will leave the plan of the survey exactly as it is with the TVDs exactly as they are and you will just change the reference so that would usually be done if you have incorrectly referenced the plan of the survey in the first place. Change TVDs however will adjust the TVDs um, in line with the new um, rotary table elevation so this is something that can be done if you have historical surveys and you are going to make a sidetrack uh, and you come along and you're going to be doing it with a different rig, with a different rotary table elevation, you can adjust your TVDs here. In our case, we not need to do that, so I'm just going to hit cancel. Next thing we're going to look at is our magnetics. Now, our magnetics are pretty important because these are required for... Um, the information in here is required for generating the ellipses of uncertainty, which has an impact on... anti-collision. So it's important that we put the correct values in here. Um, the software as standard comes with IGRF 13 and WMM 2020. Um, if you select one of these given models and then enter a date, it will automatically um, generate your declination dip and a total field. But quite often, uh, we may have magnetics that come from different models, um, IGRF or HDGM, BGGM. In that situation, we can enter those values as user-defined. And all that that does is it just gives you the ability to enter the values that you want to in here. So here, 25th of November 2019. 25th of November 2019. This date... In this particular instance, with user-defined selected, it's just for reference. This doesn't obviously generate any of these values, but you need to know what date the values were generated on, so it is important that you put it in here correctly. And we'll enter our dip. So our declination, our dip. and our total field strength. And again, like the depth reference, we're going to select this as active because we need WellSeeker to understand that these are the magnetic values to use when running those ellipse of uncertainty calculations. Now that this is done, we need to take a look at the survey program, tie on and sidetrack details. So this, this plan is a plan from surface, so there's no need to enter um, any information in the sidetrack details section. We don't worry about the survey program until the plan's been created, and we don't worry about the tie on because it's already selected from surface. Um, at this point, you have the ability, if you wish, to select a color 
that um, in any of the charts, this whale plan will always appear this given colour. Um, for this example, I'm going to fill this in and I'm going to make each of my plans a different colour so that every time we open the charts, we can clearly see which one is which. Um, but these can all, always be adjusted within the plans themselves. As long as you don't have force colour selected, you can change them to whatever colour you want in the chart. If force colour is selected, then you have to come here to manually um, uncheck this before you can change the colour. So we'll hit apply and hit close. We're now ready to start putting together our well plan. So to access our well plan, up to now in the database tree, we've been right clicking and selecting properties. Now, to access our well plan, we will be double left clicking at well plan level. So this is the level with the little blue symbol. If we double left click, it's going to open in the main dialog. Um, it's going to open up this window, which has got our tie on line, which is greyed out. And then we've got the ability to enter the measure depth, inclination and azimuth in here manually. And down the bottom, we also have our planning tools that can be used to help us build the plan. Something that is worth noting at this point is there is a level below the plan level called the planned wellbore. People often double click on this and when they open it, they think something's wrong because they don't have any ability to enter any information in here and there are no planning tools available. All that the planned well board does is it shows you a breakdown of the plan every 100 foot or 30 meters depending on your unit selected. So if you ever open up the, the window looking for your plan and you see this, you've come to the wrong level. So you should open it up at the level which is a little bit higher. So before we go ahead and start entering in our plan, we first need to put in our target because for all four of these plans, we are going to be hitting the same target, which is the Cerberus 3H target one. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to enter the target. And to enter a target, <clears throat> we do this on the database tree by right clicking and selecting targets. Something that you should be aware of is, is that targets can be accessed from um, field properties all the way down to um, well properties. And depending on the level that you access the targets dialog, depends on the reference for the vertical depth. So at plan level, my vertical depth reference, the TVD that I enter, is going to be referenced to rotary table elevation. If I access this at any level above the plan level, it's going to be referenced to system, which is mean sea level. So the values that you would enter here would be TVD sub C. Now the program will then take care of the rest. If you were to then open this up, enter it in at TVD sub C. If you then open it up at the plan level, it will add on the rotary table elevation automatically. So just take care at what level you're going to enter your target. So for our purposes, we're going to enter the target at the plan level itself. And the depth that we're going to need in here is going to be the TVD um, reference to the rotary table elevation. So to create a new target, we just select create new. And we'll go to our target data sheet. Target name, Cerberus 3H target 1. Paste this in. We've got the TVD rotary table elevation, which is 3528.5. And again, we've now got three options for entering in our target center. We're going to go again with the grid northing and the grid easting. Copy this. Again, I'm copying and pasting everything in because number one, it's a little bit easier and quicker to do it this way. Number two, it also means I'm less likely to make a mistake with manually entering the values. If I type these in, I could easily make a typo. So we'll double check our local coordinates. They're correct, and then our latitude is also correct. So I'm happy that I've got my target centre in here correctly. Um, the additional comments is this, this is a 50 foot radius target. So my target shape and size is determined on the right hand side of the screen. So the default is always point, 
we're going to go for a circle 50 foot radius and we can see that this drawing the shape of the target here for me and all that we do is we hit save it will update the information at the top and my target is now entered in addition to the target we also have a lease line now a lease line is just a polygon target so we're going to stay in the target section and we're going to create a new target we're going to call it lease line one. TVD for a lease line really doesn't make any difference um, because a lease line is taken from surface all the way down to the TD of the well. So I'm just going to enter my TVD in here of zero. And with a lease line, you always have to pick a, a center to begin with. It doesn't have to be the center of the um, of the lease line itself. It can be one of the points. Um, here we're just pasting in the, the values that we've been given. And again, we'll have just a quick check that these numbers are tying in correctly. This is also just really good to double check that you've been given the correct values and also another check that your coordinate reference system is correctly selected. So this ties in. I'm happy with that. And we're now going to select a polygon. So as a polygon target, you can enter your coordinates in two different ways, as local coordinates or as mapping coordinates. Again, that is determined down here. Check the box. So we're going to go with map. And we'll just copy these values and paste them in. And you can see instantly that your um, uh, it draws the shape of your uh, of your lease line, and again we can just double check quickly that the, the generated values look like they are tying in. So we'll just check a few of these locals just to make sure that they look correct, and they look fine. So with our lease line now entered, the important thing here is. This is no longer a polygon target. This is in fact a lease line. And to differentiate, we have to check this button down here. So the software now understands that this is a lease line. So we hit save. And what we'll do is we'll come out and we're going to go back into the targets. You can see that my target's here, but my lease line has gone. The reason for that is because I've defined it as a lease line, it's now in order to see that, you have to check this show lease lines. So I can see that my lease line's here, so it's not gone anywhere. Um, but in order to see my lease line, I have to check this box. So I'm happy with all this. And I'm now in a position that I can start putting together my plan. So our plan that we're going to put in here is design one well plan. And we can see for this plan that we're going to be using the DTFCH. So the method that we use is on the right-hand side of the uh, of the dialog, and it's the dog leg tool face curve hold. And we will be hitting the target, and then we're holding to TVD. So we'll be holding to the same TVD for every plan. So we start off with a hold TVD to eight hundred and thirteen point five. So we click on line two. And in the planning tools, we select hold, and then along here, we select TVD 813.5. Check that again, and hit calculate, and it's going to populate our line for us. So we now select line 3, and this time we're now DTF, so dog leg tool face, curve hold. So planning tool method, dog leg tool face. Tan CH is a tangent curve hold. So when we check this button, our target now becomes available to select. So we're going to select um, Cerberus 3H target 1. And we also need to enter the dog leg. And here we've used a 4 degree dog leg. 4 degree dog leg. And hit calculate. And what this has done is it has built up using a four degree dog leg, so this is your curve, and it has lined itself up 
with the target and then it is holding from this line to hit the target in the centre. Now what we'll do is we're going to use a hold TVD to 4208. So again we check on the next line, hold, check the TVD, 4208, hit calculate, and we can double check our bottom line to make sure that it all ties in and it's looking as expected. So here it does and I'm happy with my plan. So we'll hit save. Do you wish to add this plan to the survey program? Yes, I do. If we now go to our plan level, right click and go to properties, we'll see that the survey program has now populated. So it's populated with the, the start depth, the end depth, the plan of the survey that we're currently in. And then we now need to select our IPM, so our instrument performance model. Now this is very important because the IPM directly affects the size of your ellipses of uncertainty. And as a result, um, has a direct effect on your anti-collision. So it's important that we get this right. So here, for all of our plans, we're going to use MWD plus IFR1 plus MS, which is um, IFR1 is our geomagnetic model. Uh, MS is multi-station analysis correct. So we just click on the IPM box, type M to take us to the MWD, IFR1 plus MS, we hit apply, and that's now saved this for us, and we hit close. And if we open up our planned well bore, what was blank before is now broken down every 100 foot, as mentioned earlier on. So now that we've got our plan done, we can add in some lithologies and some casing information. And this is done at plan level by right clicking and selecting casings. So casing information is on our data sheet. So we've got a 20 inch casing at a 100 foot TVD. So we just type in 100 foot and the measured depth here will populate. Put this in as a conductor. 20 inch casing and a 26 inch open hole and the next line we've got a casing at 3000 feet TVD rotary table and it's a 9 and 5 eighths casing and a 12 and a quarter inch hole and that's our casings and you can have a much longer casing string in here for in our example we've only got two and lithologies again we right click at plan level and we can access lithologies if you right click on the wrong level in the database tree so above the plan these options are grayed out and not available to select so um, you know if that happens then you're trying to do it at the wrong level in the database tree so we come back down, select pathologies, and we've got <coughs> three ways that we can enter our depths in here. Measure depth, TVD or TVD sub C, and then we have our lithologies. So what we'll do is we will enter our depths here, here TVD rotary table. So we're just going to paste those in. just makes things a lot quicker and easier. And we hit apply and that's our lithologies now in. So whatever whatever depth you put in, Wellseeker will then automatically enter the measure depth of DVD sub C or two that have not been populated. We'll hit save again. So you can hit save with this little button or you can also select file, save survey. So now that we have our plan, which hits our target, we have our casings, we have our lithologies, we're now going to take a little look at some of the plots. 
So to access the plots, you can do this from the plots menu, or you can do it from the toolbar along the top. We'll just go for the plots menu at the moment. We'll have a look at the plan view. So we can now see our plan. It's in red, as expected, because we fixed the colour. But we don't see anything else. We can't see our targets on here or our casings. In order to access these and to put these on, we can either go to the Plots menu and select Chart Properties, or we can double left click on the chart itself and that will open these up. Um, there are lots and lots of options in the Chart Properties here. We're not going to go through those in this clip, but we'll just show you a couple um, to let you see the information that we've put on. So we're going to select to display the targets and that will display not just the targets but also the lease lines. If I hit OK, we'll see that these should populate and I can zoom in here and we can see that again that we've got to our target. I can do the same for my casings and we can put labels of tether lines. So again, there's my casings have popped up now. And we can't show our lithologies on the plan view plot, but we can do that in the section view. Something that's very, very useful um, within the plots menu under chart defaults is there is an option to show targets on open. And you can also do it for your um, casing symbols as well. So if we select to show targets on open, what that means is every time we open up a plot, if you have targets, they will always show on the plot every time you open. Now you can go in and you can turn these off, but it just means every time you open the plot, you don't have to go in and turn everything on. So we'll just leave this on just for ease at the moment. And if we take a look at our section view plot, in here, again, if we double click on here, we can put on our lithologies, lithology TVDs, Lithology lines, and we can maybe give them a colour. We hit OK, and we can see that our lithologies are showing on here. Again, these can be turned on for as default, but I'm not going to do that at the moment. And the last plot, probably one of the most useful plots, is going to be our 3D view. And here you can see our chart in. 3D. Okay, so now that we have got design 1 done, we're now going to go ahead and do design 2. So we'll plan design 2. This one utilises the optimum line curve hold curve method. And we can also see that this is actually a side track. And we're going to side track the design 1 at 500 feet. So we'll start off by going back to our well level, right clicking and selecting insert planned well. And our new planned well, Z goes underneath here, so we now have two planned wells. We'll take our second plan name. We're going to continue to use the bottom hole location. We're happy that our depth reference is correct because this is the default that we'd selected. We're going to stick our magnetics model in as user defined. Again, this is important for our ellipses of uncertainty. 25th of the 11th, 2019. And we'll just copy and paste these values in. We select active. Again, we're going to force this color just so that it's going to be different from the, uh, the other one. Now this time we're not tying on from surface. So in order to do this, what we'll do is we'll select plan as a side track. We only have one option to side track because we've only got one additional plan in here at the moment. So we'll side track design one at 500. I 
and hit Create Sidetrack. Warning, this action will reset the survey program. Are you sure you wish to continue? Well, the survey program doesn't have anything in it at the moment, so it doesn't matter. I'm going to select Yes. So now, from 0 to 500 feet, we are going to be using Design 1 in our survey program. So this is exactly as expected. The instrument performance model, we cannot select that here because this is coming from a well that already exists. If, this wanted, if you wanted to change this, you would have to go into your original plan. And we hit apply and we hit close. If we now double left click, it's exactly the same as we did for design one. The only difference is instead of being surface, we're now tying on at 500, which is exactly as expected. Now we know that we're going to be using the optimum align and as part of the optimum align we will, when we check this box, we will hit the target. But I don't have a target available for my drop down menu. Now I know that I created my target, I know that it's in the system, but it's at the moment I cannot see this with my new plan. So I go to my new plan, right click and go to targets. And my target's not here, but that's because it's not yet been made available to this plan. So to find it, I need to select my filter, go to well level, and here's my target. So all that we're doing is we're now making the target available to the plan or to the actual well, which would be your survey. I also need to do the same for my lease line. So show lease lines, we check this box. We've not changed anything to do with our plan or our lease line. So there's no requirement to hit save. All that you now need to do is close. And if we come back and look at our planning options, we can see that it's now available for us to select. So by checking the target, it will pull in the, the north, south, east, west and TBD coordinates. We now need to enter the rest of the information. So this is a curve hold curve. So the optimum align planning feature basically hits your target on the inclination and the azimuth that you select and you can have, in this case, we're going to have two curves and a hold and the curves are determined by 4 degree and 3 degree dog legs so down here we're going to go 4 and 3 we've selected our target now the biggest mistake that people make with this example is it now, or with this type of planning tool is they hit calculate and what happens is you will then hit your target at vertical because we've not entered in the desired inclination in azimuth. So we want to hit this on a 45 degree inclination at 200 azimuth. So 45, 200 and we hit calculate. We can see that this is now from 500 we've kicked off, we've built up to 48.4 inclination on a 146, we've then held this and then a three degree dog leg has then turned us um, and dropped us down so that we're going to hit our target at exactly the inclination azimuth that we want. We're now going to hold to our TVD of 4208. Hit calculate. Happy with this, we hit save. We right click on our plan, go to properties. In the survey program, we can select from this drop down menu here for our design two. So it will then pull in from our sidetrack depth down to the bottom of the, the plan. And we're going to select our IPM, same WD, plus IFR1 plus MS hit apply and close. I'm now happy that I've entered this my plan in. I'm just going to very quickly double check the bottom line to make sure that it's exactly the same as what I'm expecting it to be, which it is. And we're now good. Now I'm not going to put casings and lithologies in for the, the next for this plan or the next two just to save on time, but um, you should do this as part of your example so that they all have the casings and the lithologies in them. So now that I've got um, this plan done, we'll take a look in again in the plan view. We can see it's a little bit different. Our, our 
targets are on here because we selected them to be. But what I'd like to do now is I'd like to see my design one on here as well as my design two. So to do that, I have to select the offset. So I can do that by going um, tools, offset selector. This is going to open up the offset selector, which has got the wells that are available for me to select. So in this case, I only have one other well, another plan, design one, and I hit apply. Now I've selected it, but I've not yet chosen it to be on my plot. To do that, I have to select this little button here to turn the offsets on. And we can now see here are my two plans. They'll go to the same TVD, they hit the same target, but they use different methods. In the same way as we've done with our targets, in the plots menu, chart defaults, you can show offsets on open. What that means is, if you have any offsets selected, when you open up a plot, it will always show. Now again, that can be turned off, but in most cases, if you've got an offset selected, then you want it to be shown. So here, that's what we've done, and I'll leave that on. Have a quick look at my 3D plot, we can see my two plans. Target 2 is now entered, uh, plan 2 is now entered, we're now going to go ahead and we're going to do plan design 3. So design 3 is the slant well option. Um, this one is now, again, this is going to go from surface, so it's not a side track anymore. I'm going to show you a slightly different way. Instead of right clicking at the plan and selecting insert plan well, we're going to copy design one. So if I right click on design one, hit copy, move up to the plan, uh, to the well level, right click and enter paste, it's now given me a copy of design one. Notice the little two at the end, and that's because we cannot have two plans named exactly the same in the database tree. Every plan has to be uh, have a unique name. It's the same with every level within the database tree. Every field, every facility, every operator must be unique. Um, so in this case, we've got this little two. So if I right click and go to my properties, we'll just make an adjustment to the name. I'm happy with bottom hole location and well for vertical section. Depth reference is correct. Because I've copied this, I don't need to put my magnetics in again. These are already in here. So I'm happy with this. And my survey program at the moment is the same as the plan. This will change. We'll come back in and we'll double check this. So I'm happy. Hit apply and close open up my plan, all I'm going to do is highlight lines 2 to 5, hit delete, hit save, and again we have to go and access our targets to assign our target down to this level. Even copying and pasting this down won't pull the target. So we do this for both the target and the lease line. we're going to go straight into our slant well. So we just check on line two, slant well, we're going to select our target. Our kickoff point is 1450. And our build up rate is three. Hit calculate again. This planning method now gives us three lines. So the first line is the point at which we're going to go down and kick off. Then we will build up to the desired inclination in azimuth, which is automatically calculated by the program based on the target that we're trying to hit and the dog leg. And then we've just held to hit our target. And as with all the rest of them, we're then going to hold to a TVD of 4208.
calculate. Save. Yes, I do wish to add that to the survey program. We'll double check our bottom line. That looks good. It's all tying in. And if we right click and go to our properties here, just double check. The survey program's updated, so I'm happy. So we can select our two offset wells now. Hit apply. Take a look at these in the 3D plot. Now we can see one of the things that I forgot to do was change the colour. So I'm going to force this colour, we'll make this one blue. And there's just three different colours in there. I'm just going to do exactly the same thing now. I'll copy plan one. Go to our properties. And we'll go to design four. Change the name. Vertical section. Depth reference, magnetics, these are all things that you want to just double check. I'm happy with all of these because we've copied them. Change my colour this time. Um, survey program, again, we'll, that will sort itself out. So we open up our design four. Delete the plan that's already there. In many cases you might not want to delete the whole plan, you, you'll be copying and pasting this because you want to have a play with an existing plan, you might want to just change a few depths or a dog leg. Um, in our case this is just to show you how to do it. We still have to access our targets so that we can um, make these, this one available to us. This line as well. And this time we're going to be using the S well option. So the S well option, we're kicking off at 300 and we've got 2.5 and 3 degree dog legs. 300, 2.5, 3 degree dog leg and we need to remember to select our target. Now if I was to hit calculate at this point, this would kick off at 300, it would build up hold and then drop with a 3 and it would be trying to hit this target at vertical, the final inclination of 0. We don't want that in our case, we want to hit this at 20 degrees. So for us, we check this little box and we'll select enter in here 20. Hit calculate and again this is built up, hold, drop, we stayed on the same azimuth and we've hit our target. And then hold TVD 4208. Hit calculate. Save. Yes, I do. Go through the motions. We'll check our bottom line. Happy with our bottom line. And we'll just double check in our plan properties that we have got everything that is correct in the, for the survey program. So I'm happy with this. We'll look at it in the 3D plot. First of all, we need to select our offsets. So again, this little button just here, or we can go Tools, Offset Selector. Notice that at the left hand side of all these options in the menu, there is the little symbol that that corresponds on here. So once you have more experience with the software, you're probably more likely to use these little um, these little options in the toolbar. So we'll select all, hit apply, and we're going to go straight and look at our 3D plot. If I right click, I can select to center on survey, and I'll center in on my plan. I can use the up and down arrow keys on my um, keyboard 
to move up and down the well. So we can see all of the plans converge, hit the target, and then they diverge again. Now that we've got all these in and we've got them selected, there are a couple of other charts that you could take a look at. Now these are specifically for anti-collision, and um, but they'll give you an idea. So our ladder plot, this is showing us our centre to centre distance from the reference well against all of the offsets. So we start off zero, because they're all in the same place, until they all start kicking off. The centre to centre distance grows, then it comes back to the point at the target where they all hit, then it diverges again. The other quite useful plot is the separation factor plot. And this shows us our separation factor against these offset plans. Again, we start off with a separation factor of zero because they're exactly the same point. Separation factors increase, and then depending on the plan and the reference, they diverge and then come back again to the point in which we hit the same target and then diverge again. In addition to the plots, once a plan or a survey has been entered, uh, we may want to do some reports or generate some reports. So in order to do that, you'll have your plan open and we go to our reports menu and you select the relevant report that you want. So in this case, um, we'll select survey reports. And the software comes with four templates. Uh, these are all editable and uh, as a user, you can create uh, as many new report templates as you want. For this example, we're going to use our standard planning report. Um, we can choose whether or not this is going to be PDF or Excel, so we'll start with PDF. And then you can choose the report columns that you want to include and the report options. Um, any changes that you make here, if you want to save these so that the report's saved with those selections, you just make the adjustment and hit apply and it will save this for you. So we're just going to leave this as the standard report format. And down here, we're going to choose how we would like this to be interpolated. So as this is a plan, I want to interpolate this every 100 foot. This will basically break my plan down um, from surface to, to TD um, every 100 foot, um, but nothing in between. So if we want our lines in here to appear, we're also going to have to select include stations and include final stations. If these aren't checked, then there will not be, unless your line is exactly um, divisible by 100, it will not show up. So here we've got include final station, include stations. We've also got in the reporting options, um, lithologies and casings, and what this does is this interpolates those and it will put lines in for them. You don't have to have that selected. Um, in the case of um, plan two, which is a sidetrack, if I was to just do this, it would give me my report from 500 feet onwards, which is my sidetrack point. If I wanted to include everything, I would select whole well path. So now I've got this done, we just hit create. This now creates our Standard planning report gives us all of our details that we are looking for, that we need, the facility, the well, well bore, casings, lithologies, the plans themselves. And then we've got the planning report, which now breaks it down. We can see we've got our formations uh, every 100 foot. Um, and we'll also have our um, various lines from our plan in here, along with the, uh, the last line at TD. You can do exactly the same in Excel.
and this just gives you an editable format that can be provided to somebody if they want to pull the plan into a, um, a different software. So the final thing that we're going to look at now is the wall plot composer. And the wall plot composer um, can be accessed via the tools menu, wall plot composer, and this allows us to pull not just individual plots together, but we can pull several plots along with um, table information, and we can save templates and then print these out. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do when we're in here is we're going to select File, Page Setup, and you select your page size. So this can be anything from A0 down to A7. Um, in our case, we'll keep with an A4 plot, and you can select your orientation of portrait or landscape. So we'll go with the portrait A4 plot. We can now go to the view menu and we can enter uh, or we can add a page border. And now we can start adding in plots and tables and there's a couple of ways to do that. You can go insert, new chart, you go for a plan view. Can move this across here or we can right click and we can say insert chart and go to the section view with charts if you check if you click on the chart so that it's selected we can go to tools object border on and this gives us a border around about our Um, chart itself and if we want to um, add things or make any adjustments to these charts themselves we can do that again just by double left clicking on the chart and you know, using all of the options that are, that are available to us um, within here to basically make the chart look the way that we want it to. Uh, I'm not going to go through that because there's a lot of information in here and that will be covered in a, in a, different, um, a different video. So we can enter in our um, as many charts as we want. We can adjust these. We can zoom in to take a bit of closer look. We can put borders on these and we can put borders around the plots themselves. We can also add in tables. We put a project table in. And with your table, you can make this bigger, smaller, whatever you want. But be aware that depending on the size and shape that you pick, it can distort the uh, the way the text looks. And this is because the aspect ratio has been um, has been distorted. So if we want to, as a general rule, you would fill the space that you want to fill with your um, with your uh, table. And then once you've done that, select the table and select this option up here to reset the aspect ratio of the table. The software will then just pull that into a size that, that keeps the aspect ratio and makes it look the way that it, that it needs to look. If we just put in a summary table in here, we'll do the same thing again. And pull that in. The other thing we can do is we can pull logos in. So if we insert our logo. Again, we can resize our logo, we can move it to where we want it to, and we can reset the aspect ratio on this as well via this option, which is specifically for the logo. You can see that that's reset this. If I want to line things up, then what I'll do is I'll select the object that I want to move, select how we want it to be lined up and then select the object we want it to be lined up to. And we can see in this op in this situation I've just lined up this table with the edge of my logo. Now that I've got all of this on here we can actually save um, this template and we can just go to um, Save Wall Plot Composer save it to my desktop, just call it test. And this now saves a template, which means that I can access this um, 
If I close this down and I can go back in, select my template and it will pull this in with the charts and the tables in exactly the same position as they were before. Some other things that are useful to know within the Wall Plot Composer, um, we can of course put offset wells onto our plots as well. But you must be aware that the offset selector in the wall plot composer is completely independent of the one in the main user interface. So even although I may have all the offset wells selected in the main user interface, when I come in here, I would need to select these again. So I would just select them, hit apply, and I can turn those on in my chart. The other thing is, um, when you are creating wall plots and putting charts in the wall plot composer, by its very nature, um, scaling is important. So scaling within the wall plot composer is much more important um, than on the main user interface charts. So as a result, um, WellSeeker will not allow you to distort the aspect ratio. So in, in a normal section view plot um, on the main user interface, you can have different scale for the X and the Y um, because this the scale's not really an issue. For a wall plot composer, um, the idea behind this is that we want our charts to, to be properly scaled, and as a result, it's not possible to distort that. So if you select the scale, um, and you notice that um, when you make adjustments sometimes, it, the plot won't allow you to adjust this sometimes in the way that you maybe want to and that's because you're trying to do something that will distort the aspect ratio so as a result just be aware that um, the scales um, for the x and the y axis will need to be the same um, and this is a common a common question that comes up as people start to mess about with them um, with or play about with the wall plot composer and um, in the main user interface you are able to set your scales for your x and your y to whatever you want them to be but you cannot do that um or you can do it in the um the wall plot composer but they have to be the same so now that we've actually got our um wall plot created we can print it out um be aware when you're working in your wall plot composer if you have dual screens you want to be working on your primary monitor. Um, if you're not working on your primary monitor, when you try to print this out, it can all be distorted. So that's, a, a, again, a common um, question that comes up. Um, so make sure when you're in the wall plot composer, you're in your primary screen. So all that we do now is we just go File, Print, select your PDF printer, very important is that we then go to properties we're going to select high quality print and in the layout you have to select the same page size and orientation as you are as you have selected in the wall plot composer so if you have selected an a0 plot and you want to print this to pdf you must select a0 plot here um, otherwise it won't print correctly so i'm happy with this okay Okay, save it to the desktop. And you can see our wall clock composer has now printed out. We now have some questions relating to the video that you've just watched. As I go through the questions, I'll bring up the answers on the right hand side. Before I bring up the answers, you should pause the video and see if you can answer these by yourself before the answer pops up. So question number one. What is the difference between plan level and planned wellbore level in the database tree? Plan level is editable and contains the planning tools, while the planned wellbore level displays a breakdown of the plan every 100 foot is not editable and has no planning tools. So the planned wellbore level is the lowest level in the database tree and when you open that up everything's greyed out and it's just used for visualising the plan 
every 100 foot or centimetres. Question number two. What level in the database tree do you access lithologies and casings? Plan level. When you right click on the database tree, depending on the level that you're accessing, um, certain options will be available and certain options will be greyed out. The only level that you can access lithologies and casings is plan level. Question number three. Why is it important to enter the magnetic reference values for your plans and surveys? It's so important because these are used in the ellipse of uncertainty calculations which affects anti-collision. Question number four. When using multiple screens, does it matter which one you use when working in the wall plot composer? Yes, it does. Only the computer's primary screen should be used as Wall Plot Composer is not supported on additional monitors. So if you're going to use the Wall Plot Composer, make sure Well Seeker is on your primary screen before you open it. Question number five. In the Wall Plot Composer, why do the minimum and maximum values I enter for the X and Y axis sometimes change? In the wall plot composer, the aspect ratio of the charts must be maintained. If the minimum or maximum values entered for the X or Y axis causes the scale of these axes to be different, WellSeeker readjusts the scale and therefore the values to maintain the aspect ratio. We're now going to take a look at the exercise. So for the end of this video exercise, would like you to work through the Excel example which has been provided and build a database using the same methodology demonstrated in the video. As mentioned previously at the beginning of the video, the provided example may not include the same data as the worked example. Uh, in this situation, all that you need to do is follow the methodology using the supplied data. If at any point you become stuck, just refer back to the video for a refresher. And that now concludes our introduction to well planning video.